Good morning and blessed Sabbath to each and every one. It's a great privilege that we have to be able to gather together in the house of the Lord to worship Him and to praise Him. Many Sabbaths though, I'm away. Many Sabbaths, many of the brethren in this church, we are away. And we go somewhere, even next Sabbath, we will be away. Many of us here going to conferences, camp meetings, and helping brethren in different places. And the world has changed. So we don't often travel like we used to. When we travel, most of the time we travel by plane. We go somewhere, but we're very busy. I, for example, I'm very busy. And so time on a plane is not free time. Time on a plane is not time to sleep. And so all of us, we have these tools, very good tools, called laptops. You all know what a laptop is? It's a little computer. You carry it around with you, and it lets you work wherever you are. So you can't use your plane, you can't use your laptop when the plane takes off. So you're waiting patiently, probably reading, doing something else, while we wait for the plane to get to the proper altitude. And as soon as the pilot turns off that little fastened seatbelt sign, you can see all the people who are really hard workers because they immediately dive under their seats, take out their bags, and pull out their laptops. It's now a very common thing to see. But what is uncommon to see is for a person to pull out a laptop and a Bible. You see, when I'm working, I often have to use my Bible. And I have a Bible on my computer, but for some reason, I can't find things in my Bible on the computer. But in this Bible here, it's my Bible, here I can find things. You're familiar with that? You're sitting along and, and you know that, that such a verse exists, but you forget which one it is, but you know that it's around this place in the, and it's on such part of the page. Have you ever had that experience? It happens all the time to me. And so I can't just use the Bible that I have on my computer. When I'm working on preparing a Sabbath school lesson, I have to pull out my actual Bible and read it from the actual printed paper. Well, I was flying recently. Actually, it was earlier this summer. And, of course, the light went off, and I immediately dove down, pulled out my computer bag, got out my computer and my Bible. Well, this is very curious for people. They are not used to seeing a young person pull out a Bible and read a Bible. They're used to seeing young people pull out a laptop, but it's probably going to be to play games. Right? So here was a person, and he opened a Bible. And the lady who was beside me, a business lady who was traveling to Europe for one of the clients that she was representing, she got curious. She couldn't contain herself. And she started to have a discussion. And that was fine with me. So we began to talk. And eventually in our discussion, when it came to what I did for a living, because that was the whole purpose why she asked why I'd pulled out a Bible, and I began to tell her. And then she said, which, which church do you belong to? And I told her, I said, I'm a Reformed Adventist. And she said, oh, I know those people. I said, really? She said, yes, I know you people. And she became sad. Now I was a little bit confused. She became sad. She said, yes, I know you people. You're the people with all those rules, right? You have plenty of rules, lots of commandments and rules that you follow and things that you do. And I said, yes, that's, that's, that's essentially correct. And she said, oh, well, I'm not like that. She said, I am free. Well, we continued talking a little bit and... Then after a while, the meal came and she got distracted and that was the end of our discussion for a while. We talked a little bit more later, but her words made me think. You see, if she is free, then what am I? Then I'm a slave. There is no other option. Either you are a free man or you are a slave. And if she was correct, then I was a slave. And I live in America. I mean, I was born in Canada, but in both of these countries, we have constitutions which guarantee that we are free. And I had to consider for myself, and we're going to consider today, who is free? You see, in Canada, we're taught that in the Constitution of Canada, there are three fundamental guarantees. Every Canadian is guaranteed by the Constitution these three fundamental liberties. They are peace, 
order and good government. These are the three th things enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Every person has the right to peace, to order, and to good government. In America, it is different. Right? We also have three things that are enshrined here for us that the Constitution guarantees for us in the United States. Three fundamental freedoms. What are they? We have the right to life. We have the right to liberty. And we have the right to the pursuit of happiness which is defined by the Supreme Court as the pursuit of property. You have the right to own property. So now, we have these three fundamental rights. Now we, as God's people, we also have a charter of rights and freedoms. Did you know that God guarantees to us that He will give us things that guarantee our freedom to ensure that we will not be slaves? He says, I give you these things as guarantees of your freedom. The first guarantee of our freedom is that we are free from personal hatred. God says, I guarantee to you that you will be free from personal hatred. Where do we find this? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. We're going to use our Bibles a lot today, so keep your Bible handy. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. What's your first fundamental guarantee? The first fundamental guarantee is that you will have love. Why? Because as a child of God, it says that if you know Him, you will know love. Let's repeat the verse. He that knoweth not God, can he love? He cannot love. Because he doesn't know God. Because God is love. For us, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it continues to say, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. What's the first guarantee that God gives you? God says, I guarantee you love. That means we are free from what? We are free from hatred. Hate is the opposite of love. You can love something or you can hate something. Some people like to think that there are degrees between there, but there are not. If you don't love something, then you hate it. <coughs> and God says, I free you from this. Did you know that scientists have proved that chemically... Hatred is bad for you. Amen. That when you hate, your mind, your brain produces certain chemicals which enter into your system, which cause you that pain, that build pressure into your brain. Hatred is actually physical pain. And God says, I free you from this. I don't want you to have any hatred. I guarantee you that right to love. Where is this written? Because we know that God is love. Where is this actually enshrined in the Bible? Let's read together in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. What does it say there? You know this verse by heart. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What is God? God is love. And God says to you and to me, I guarantee to you the right to love. You know why? Because you will have no other gods before me. That's our first fundamental guarantee from God. Our first liberty that He grants us. But He doesn't stop there. God grants us even more liberties and freedoms that He promises to us. He frees us from needing to waste time Worshipping useless idols. We can see that today many people worship idols. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul writing to the Galatians, chapter 3 verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. He, he, what does he say to the Galatians? He says, oh, what kind of Galatians? 
Foolish Galatians. Why were they foolish? They had been bewitched that they should not obey the truth. They were worshipping something that they didn't need to worship. Does that happen today? Are there people who worship false gods? Are there idol worshippers today? I'm looking at this lady. She's sitting beside me. In our conversation, I discovered that she had gone. She is now on her third husband. She has children with all three. She has stepchildren and others and so forth. And, and um, she is... She is slightly overweight. Okay. She has all kinds of difficulties and problems. And if you ask her about her first husband, I guarantee you that she will violate the first fundamental freedom that God has granted us because she hates him. Okay. Now here, does some of us, we have problems with idol worship. It's true. Even now God frees us from idol worship. Some of us may have this one in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. We find there a very, very clear idol worship that can be found. Even amongst people who say that they don't worship idols. But in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, who are these enemies? Because, brethren, of course, if I tell you that you're an enemy of the cross of Christ, this is not a positive thing. And here it says in the next verse, verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is what? Whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. People who mind earthly things, what are they doing? They are making of these things gods. <coughs> They're worshipping false gods. It can be their belly, for example. Maybe we make of our food a god. It can be our ears. Right? Maybe we have to listen to certain kinds of things. It can be our eyes. Maybe we have to watch TV or some of these things. Right? It can be all of these things can become idols to us. And God says to us, he says, I guarantee that you will be free from all these things. He says, I guarantee you, you will not have to waste your time. It won't matter to you what's the next show going to be about. It won't matter to you what's the most popular thing. You won't have to waste your money on all of these things. God says, I free you from all these things. I remember when I was in university, they taught us very much about personal liberty. And they were always trying to tell us to be different. Be an individual. Be different. And I was different. Right? But for them, this kind of different was wrong. Right? So they tell you, be different. But at the same time, they actually want you to all listen to the same kind of music, watch the same kind of show, read the same kind of books, eat the same kind of food, but be different. This makes no sense. Right? They're bewitched. Don't you feel sorry for them? Amen. I feel very, very sorry for these poor slaves Amen. in the world who are there. But we, we are free from these things. Right? What, where is this freedom guaranteed for us? How is it that God tells us that we will have this freedom? Where is it found? In Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, we have the second point in our charter of rights and freedoms as God's people. It says there, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Do we have this freedom? It's guaranteed to us. This second freedom is guaranteed in God's word that we will be free from wasting ourselves on idolatry like the rest of the world. But it's more than this. God frees us from something else as well. He frees us from speaking unnecessary words. 
Did you know that? God says, don't breathe more than you need to. God says, don't, you don't need to say more words than is absolutely necessary. And in our worship, He says that we can be simple. He says that in our worship, we don't need vain repetitions. Right? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, we have the beginning of this third fundamental freedom that's guaranteed to us, freedom from irreverent speech. In Matthew 6, verse 7, it says, But when ye pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they, that, for, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. <coughs> Don't you feel sorry for these people? I feel sorry for these slaves who are required to repeat 10, 20, 50, 100 times the same prayer. When the priest tells them, go and say the Hail Mary 50 times. Go and say the Our Father 25 times. What benefit do they have? These poor people. God says, it's not necessary for you to use these vain repetitions. They think that for their much speaking, that God will hear them. You know, sometimes we are like this. What happens? You know what happens. You're talking with somebody or with a group of people, and they don't agree with you, what do you do? It happens all the time to me as well. What do we do? We get louder. We seem to think that our argument has more validity if we scream. Does it actually have any more power? No. None. No, God says, when you speak to me, how will you speak? Simply, clearly. You have no need to all this vain repetition. In fact, you can be free from all kinds of angry words. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, Proverbs 16, verse 32, it says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Now, where is this freedom guaranteed? Where in the charter is written this freedom from irreverent speech? You know, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7, what is written there? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Three fundamental freedoms. We have three in Canada. We have three here in the United States. And we've gone through three fundamental freedoms that God has given us. But you know, God is more generous than humanity. And God gives us even more freedom than that. This lady who was beside me. I should mention that from time to time in our discussion, she used words which I could not use in this sermon. I feel sorry for her. She's a slave to her tongue, that she has to use such language. But more than this, she's a very busy lady. In all our discussion, the most that I got from her was that she is always <coughs> very, very, very busy. She never has free time. She's always busy all the time. You know, God knows that we will be like this. So you know what God has done? He has freed us from daily toil. God says, you need a little bit of freedom. At the time when the disciples were most busy, what did Christ tell them in Mark chapter 6, verse 31? At the time when they were very busy, and they had a lot of pressure put upon them, and there was a lot of work that needed to be done, in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, Christ said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Christ says, you need time. I know how you are. I know how you are, David. You're going to work and work and work, and you're going to work so much, you're going to get sick. And God says, David, you need some time to be alone with me. You need some time to rest. He says, I'm going to guarantee you the freedom to rest. 
That's what God tells us. In fact, in Jeremiah 15, 16, we find out that when we have this rest, what do we do in this time of rest? Jeremiah 15, verse 16, it says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. What did Jeremiah do when he needed to commune with God? What did he do? He found the word. What do we do on the Sabbath? What do we do? We study God's word. We commune with Him. We spend time with Him. And we rest. We do no work. I feel sorry for this lady. She works all the time and she tells me when she gets a chance, she goes to church. When she gets a chance, when she's not too busy, she goes to church. And she may drive there 15 minutes to her church and she may spend an hour there or maybe two hours and then she may drive home again and then she's back to work again. This poor lady, she has no free time. This poor lady, she is a slave. I am free. Amen. Because once a week, for 24 hours, God says to me, do no work. Just spend time with me. That's all you have to do. You need to rest. Where is this fundamental freedom guaranteed to us? Where? You know. Exodus chapter 20 Verses 8 to 11, we only read the beginning of verse 8. What does it say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What does God say to us? It was holy. In fact, the verses continue to say, not only should you not do any work, but if you have a business, let that business rest. Let your family rest. Let your farm rest. Let your land rest. Rest, relax, and enjoy this one day with me. Spend one day with God. Brethren, what a wonderful freedom we have. The liberty that we have from God. He says, I know that the world is going to try and destroy your health. The world is going to make you so busy. But don't worry, because I guarantee you the freedom to spend one day of the seven days of the week in complete peace. It's wonderful. God frees us for more though. That's just four. There's more. He, freed us, he frees us from ingratitude, from filial ingratitude. Because God says to us, I want you to have a long life. That's what He says. I want you to have a long life. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, for all the children, we were singing songs from the children's section at the beginning of the service, and we'll sing one more at the end. But it says to us, who are spiritually children, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the problem in our day and age? What's the problem in our day and age today? All these families that are splitting apart. Children using drugs. Children running away from home. Children doing all of these things. Why is it that, we, that the world today has so many problems with children? That they have to have a whole branch of psychology just to deal with children. Why is it? Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it was prophesied 2,000 years ago that this will happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Some of you know my mother. My mother did not take a lot of disobedience from us. We did not have many opportunities to be disobedient when I was growing up. We had one. But you didn't have a second chance to be disobedient on that point because you learned that you were disobedient the first time you did it. Today, we live in a world where you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that because 
the child may need therapy later if you do that. So what you should do instead is you should allow them to continue to express them. Oh, if he wants to kill hamsters in the backyard, let him continue doing that. <coughs> That's the world that we live in. And children grow up to be disobedient. They grow up to be problems to the community. And we see the general breakdown of society. Most historians, when studying American history, they see many parallels between American history and the history of Rome. You know, Rome was at one time a republic too. Before she decayed into an empire, she was a republic. And they had very strict rules about the family because they understood that the family was the first building block of society. And historians, most historians will agree that the time when the Roman Empire fell apart is when these rules went away from the families. As families began to break apart, those ideas began to break away, and now we saw all the problems that came, and that empire became destroyed. And we see the same thing in America today. But for us, for God's people, did you know that we're free from this? Did you know that God's people are free from these kind of problems, societal problems that are going on? We are. Where does God guarantee us this freedom? Where is it written for us? In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, what is written? It says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God says to us, I free you from these things. I don't want you to have these problems. I want you to be free. That's what He tells us. Now we're also free in another way. We are free from hating others. Now I know this sounds a little bit awkward, but this also has to do with your tongue. You see, we're, many people will die by the sword. And God says, I don't want you to die by the sword. You know the example when Peter was in the garden there, the disciple, and when Christ was being taken, and he wanted to defend him. And he took up a sword, and he said, I will defend you. And he sliced off the ear from that one guard, from the Roman guard. What happened then? What did Christ say to him? Jesus said in verse, this is Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, Christ said unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. God says, I don't want you to die. I want you to live. Why is it that we are conscientious objectors? Why is it that we don't take part in the wars of this world? Because God says, I free you from these things. I don't want you to have to die. Because they that take the sword, they will die by the sword. Yet many Christians today, what do they want to do? Mm, they are repeating the history of the Middle Ages. How did they want to defend Christianity in the Middle Ages? Oh, we will take the sword and we will go and kill the heathen. I hear the same thing today. America is doing the same things today that were repeated in the past. And they didn't work then and they won't work now. Why? What does the Bible say? In John chapter 18, verse 36, what does Christ say about His people? In John 18, verse 36, He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. We're free from this. God says, I free you from these things. You have no need to fight for this world because your kingdom is not from this world. You're free from dying by the sword. You're free from killing yourself as well. Did you know that? You're also free from killing yourself. I, I said, well, you wouldn't do that, would you? Would you kill yourself? Right. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, brethren, we be debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Right. Now, in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, 
page 454. I'll just read one sentence here from this chapter. Volume 4, page 454. It says, Overeating is the sin of this age. And in this day with God, page 123, it's an easy one to remember, 123, from this day with God, it says, By showing contempt for the laws of nature, men and women lay the foundation for misery and suffering. Through the weakness of their moral powers, they are abject slaves to passion. Some are digging their graves with their own teeth. <coughs> I'm looking at this poor lady beside me, eating her, I think it was beef or it was something red, I don't know. Mm -hmm. right? This poor lady right? who's eating these things, she's digging her own grave with her own teeth. <coughs> she's a slave. What did she say to me? Oh, I am free. Right? This poor lady, she is a slave. More than this, we are free because we do not kill anyone else, not only by the sword, but we don't kill anyone with our other sword. What's our other sword? Tongue. The tongue. We don't kill from this either. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, how are God's people described? In Romans <laughs> chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Be kindly, affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Anybody who will speak about somebody else, what are they doing? They are committing murder. If somebody comes to you and they say, oh, um, hmm, uh, well, yeah, you know, I want to talk about this other guy over here. What are they doing? They're committing murder because they hate. We're free from these things. Where does it say that we're free from these things? Where is it guaranteed to us? Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. What does it say? Thou shalt not kill. God makes our freedom so simple. More than this, He frees us from moral impurity. We can see that in the world around us. People who are suffering from sicknesses, from diseases, who are suffering... Be mentally because of the breakdown of the families and society around us. We don't have to worry about this. Because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, what does Christ say to us? Matthew 5, 27, 28. He says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And God says, I don't want you to have to suffer. I don't want you to worry. So I will give you a seventh freedom. What's our seventh freedom? In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. What's the seventh freedom? It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So while the world has to suffer and go through all of these things, what does it say for us? Don't worry. From these things, you are free. I free you from these things. It also frees us from theft, from being robbers and stealers. Now, I know you're saying I'm not about to go and rob the local Wachovia. Right? You're not going to do that, right? But many people rob anyways. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, because ye say, Wherein have ye robbed thee? in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. These poor people in the world, they live under a curse. Why? Because they've robbed God from what is His. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309, commenting on Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, the Spirit of Prophecy writes, The Eighth Commandment, which we will today call the Eighth Freedom, condemns man-stealing and slave-dealing and forbids wars of conquest. It condemns theft and robbery. It demands strict integrity in the minutest details of the affairs of life. It forbids overreaching in trade and requires the payment of just debts or wages. 
It declares that every attempt to advantage oneself by the ignorance, weakness, or misfortune of another is registered as fraud in the books of heaven. You see, these poor people in the world, right? like this lady beside me on the plane, she has to figure out how to trick people into buying things that they don't need. Because the product that she sells is something that actually people don't need. Okay? And now what she has to do is she has to go and she has to trick these people into buying things that they don't need. Can you imagine what her life is like? She knows that people don't need these things. But she has to convince them that they need it. I feel sorry for her. She's a slave. She's a robber and a thief. And God says to us, you, you will be free. If you have a business, what will you do? You will operate it properly. You will operate it according to how it should be done. You will not try and cheat anybody. You will not try and take from anybody what you shouldn't. And I will bless you, God says. But these poor people in the world, they are slaves. For us, God guarantees this freedom. Where is it guaranteed? In Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, what does it say? Thou shalt not steal. Be free from this. You don't have to worry about this. You will be free from these things. Now, the ninth freedom that's guaranteed will take us a couple of minutes to go through. Because the ninth freedom is the freedom from a lying tongue. You know what happens when you lie? What do you have to do? Right? You, have to, you have to lie again. Right? It's... It's just something that happens, right? Because you don't want to be caught in the first lie, so what must you do? You must do it again, right? You know, psychologically what happens to you if I tell you that my father is Korean, right? Now you know my father. Is he Korean? No, right? But I tell you, oh, well, um, my father is Korean. Right? Now, you, you say, well, well not... not I have to repeat it, right? Then, no, he's Korean, right? And then it, a week later, I, uh, he's Korean. Eventually, what happens to me? I start actually thinking that my father is Korean, right? And this fake reality which I set up, it becomes real. It becomes the real thing. It becomes what's in my mind, right? You always have to come up with creative things to say. It's a very unfortunate thing. But once you start down the road, you have to spend so much brain power on this that you're distracted from the things that you should actually be thinking about, right? And God says, I don't want you to be distracted. I don't want you to have to worry about these things. I want your mind to be free, to be clear. Right? So how should you speak? How should we speak? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, Christ tells us about our communication. Matthew 5, 37 says, But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of what? Cometh of evil. Right? That's what's here. Christ says, be simple in your speech. Right? Don't worry about any of these things. In Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, commenting on this verse, the Spirit of Prophecy says on page 68, these words condemn all those meaningless phrases and expletives that border on profanity. They condemn the deceptive compliments, the evasion of truth, the flattering phrases, the exaggerations, the misrepresentations in trade that are current in society and in the business world. They teach that no one who tries to appear what he is not, or whose words do not convey the real sentiment of his heart, can be called truthful. We're free from these things. How will our communication be? Yea, yea, nay, nay, yes or no. Mm -hmm. Oh, you look so pretty today. What? If you don't, if you don't actually believe it, if it's not true, right? don't say it. Right? All of these meaningless compliments, unnecessary words, these are corrupt things. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 tells us, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I know some people who I only hear negative things from them. I know some people like this. I never hear a pleasant word from them. You ever, no matter what, they always have something negative or down to say to you. These people have corrupt communication. They have no joy in their heart. Also covered here is freedom from gossip. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 6, it says, The getting of treasure by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro to them that seek death. So now, the spirit of prophecy commenting on this verse comments this way. This is from Testimonies, Volume 2, pages 185 to 187. That's a little bit of a long reading, but I'd like us to read the whole thing. Because if I say that we're free from a lying tongue, many of us will say, yep, I'm free from that. But I want you to pay close attention to what's here. It says, when sisters who are given to talk get together... Now, it may be applicable to the men as well here, so let's be general. But it says, when sisters who are prone to talk get together, Satan is generally present, for he finds employment. He stands by to excite the mind and make the most of the advantage he has gained. He knows that all this gossip and tale-bearing and revealing of secrets and dissecting of character separate the soul from God. It is death to spirituality and a calm religious influence. Sister Yu sins greatly with her tongue. She ought by her words to have an influence for good, but she frequently talks at random. Sometimes her words put a different construction upon things that they will bear. Sometimes there is an exaggeration. Then there is a misstatement. There is no intention to misstate, but the habit of much talking and talking upon, these, upon things that are unprofitable has been so long cherished that she has become careless and reckless in her words and frequently does not know what she is stating herself. Remember what we mentioned before? That you do it so often that it becomes normal for you? Mm -hmm. Continues to say, this destroys any influence for good she might have. It (laughs) It is time there was an entire reform in this respect. Her society has not been prized as it would have been had she not indulged in this sinful talking. That's one paragraph. The next paragraph is harder. Next paragraph says, Christians should be careful in regard to their words. Now this paragraph is important because we read the first one and we say, oh, that was Sister You. But this next paragraph is not about Sister You. Who is this next paragraph for? For us. It says, Christians should be careful in regard to their words. They should never carry unfavorable reports from one of their friends to another. Especially if they are aware that there is a lack of union between them. It is cruel to hint and insinuate. As though you knew a great deal in regard to this friend or that acquaintance of which others are ignorant. Such hints go further and create more unfavorable interpretations, impressions, than to frankly relate the facts in an unexaggerated manner. What harm has not the Church of Christ suffered from these things? The inconsistent, unguarded course of her members has made her weak as water. Confidence has been betrayed by members of the same church. And yet the guilty did not design to do mischief. Lack of wisdom in the selection of subjects of conversation has done much harm. 
In fact, if there is somebody in the church who, who does gossip, what should happen? What should happen to a person who has gossiped in the church? They should be disciplined by the church. There is clear evidence in Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy that if a person gossips, they should be put on church discipline. They should be studied with, and if the habit continues, they should, if necessary, even be put out of the church. Why? Why is this so serious a thing that a person can be disciplined for that? What is gossip? If I come to Brother Paul and I say, mm, I found out something about Brother Eduardo. Now, I can't tell you what it is. I can't, I'm not going to tell you what it is because that would be gossip. Right? But I know something about Brother, well, Lem, oof. and I just leave it at that. Right? I don't tell you what it is. I say, I know something. Right? And I feel comfortable. I say, oh, well, <laughs> well, I'm not, I haven't told them what it is. Right? So I'm not a gossiper. Right? But in reality, what have I done now? Poor Brother Paul, he's driving home today and he's like, hey, wait a second. Maybe Brother Eduardo did this. No, 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 no. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was this. What happened now? Right? What have I done? I have, I have committed gossip. Right? Regardless of what I may think to myself, I've done that. Right? If somebody comes to you and they say, I know something about Brother David, what should you do? You should say, oh, tell me quick, because I want to know too. What should you say? Somebody comes to me and says, I know such and such about Sister Burek. What should I do? I should tell that person to go and talk to Sister Burek. Amen. Right? If, you, if, there, if you know that I'm doing something wrong, who should you go to? You should tell me. I may not know. I may be doing something wrong without even knowing it. Amen. Right? And I need instruction. Instead, you may go to some... Does it help me that you went and told somebody else? That has no help for me at all. So scripture tells us that if we see something, where should we go? Go to that person. But the world is full of gossipers. The world is full of people who are, who are they don't tell other people. They, they, they tell somebody else. There are whole parts of newspapers, called, they're even called gossip columns. They're even called gossip columns. Gossip is something you don't even know if it's true. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Let me share it with you. Well, I can write a newspaper like that too. I could write a wonderful newspaper if I didn't have to check if anything was true. I could just make up a bunch of stuff. But God's people, we're free from these things. We're free from a lying tongue. In fact, we're told in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, that if we will be God's people, in Titus 1.15, that unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. If we will be Christians, God says, I don't want you to have all these things in your head. Right? Unnecessary things. So I free you from this. Right? In fact, I want your mind to be only pure, to have no disease, to have no corruption. I want your mind to be pure. And so what does he tell us? Right? In Exodus 20, 16, what is, what is the ninth freedom of, that we are guaranteed? It says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now there's one more freedom, and then we're done. One more fundamental freedom that God guarantees to us, and that's the freedom from covetousness. You know, we live in a consumer society. Right? And the whole point of our society is to get you to buy things that you don't need. When you go to Walmart, the majority of things in Walmart you don't need. Amen. The vast majority of the things when you walked into you don't need. We were up at the missionary school. I went shopping with one of the, the sisters who was responsible to, to buy some things. You remember Brother Romero and I were, went shopping and there was a sister who came as well who knew kind of the things that we needed. And we had a list. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of one of those classical guy shoppers. You, know? you go into the store, you go directly to the thing that you need, you put it in the cart and you leave. 
Right. Well, we walked in the store, and we were supposed to go this way. The doors here, you know, this the store. The doors we went in on this door on this side. What we needed was actually on the other side. So when we got in, I, I had the cart and I started moving in that direction. And she said, "Oh, let's go over here." I said, "Why? Well, I want to see over here." <laughs> No, no, we need to go over there. We need to get what we need. We need to leave this place. Right? But we live in a society where everything is about Madison Avenue. You know, that's where they do the advertising. You know, everything is about advertising to you things that you don't actually need. Even medication. We, we're so bad in our society today that they're trying to get you to believe that you need to take drugs. You don't even know. Most people now today think that they're sick because they've seen all these commercials. Maybe, maybe I really do have diabetes. Maybe I do have high blood pressure. Maybe I do. We don't even know, but we're so bombarded to get these things, we don't even know if we need them. All of a sudden, we become sick. Oh, man, I, I really do have heart disease. Right? I better take the purple pill. I better, I have a lot of depression. Right? We get all of these things. We live in such a society. And God says that I will free you from this kind of society. I will free you from having things that you don't even need. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309, it says, The 10th commandment strikes at the very root of all sins, prohibiting the selfish desire from which springs the sinful act. He who in obedience to God's law refrains from indulging even a sinful desire for that which belongs to another will not be guilty of an act of wrong to for, toward his fellow creatures. So we covet, we want things, and you know this, we, we don't even want to look the way that we look. You know we live in a society where women especially, well even men today, but women are encouraged to, to paint another face on top of the face which they have. I'm looking at this poor lady beside me, how much time she must have spent that morning. Right? to paint another face on top of the face that God gave her. And you know what she said? She said that I'm a slave. Who's the slave? This poor lady right? who has to spend hours in the morning painting on her extra face, deciding which color of hair she's going to have this month. Right? Who's the slave? And who's free? Right? Where is this last fundamental freedom guaranteed for us? The last one. You know, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. You know that God has made us free. Amen. God has said to us that I want you to be free from all these things. While the world is perishing and dying and all these things that they have to do and tricked into thinking that they're free when in fact, what are they? They are slaves. Now I know that we read this charter of rights and freedoms for every Christian. And many people call those the Ten Commandments. Right? I call them the Ten Freedoms. There are Ten Freedoms. Our Ten Rights that God has given us, promised us, where He's told us, I promise you that you will have freedom from all of these things. Isn't that wonderful? That God has promised this to us? And it's my wish and my prayer that we'll remember this. How is it then that we're free? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again, with the yoke of bondage. God says, He that loves me will keep my commandments. God says, If you love me, I set you free. I will set you free. And then, of course, to close, let's read that last verse which Brother Eduardo read for us at the beginning of our service. If we'll be free, if we'll love God, if we'll obey His commandments, if we'll accept His guarantees of freedom, if we will be free from personal hatred, if we will be free from empty, disappointing idols. 
if we will be free from irreverent speech, if we'll be free from daily toil, if we'll be free from filial ingratitude, if we'll be free from hatred towards others, free from moral impurity, free from spiritual theft, free from a lying tongue, free from covetousness, if we'll be free from these things, what does Christ say? In John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. And it's my wish and prayer for each one of us today that we will be free in Christ. Amen. Amen.